Even though I might have been temporarily insane at the time, I had lost none of my intellect. I knew that magical visions were certainly hypnotic. In this respect, Crowley had been absolutely right. Solomon's genie would not come forth from caverns beneath the earth. They would rise out of the nether reaches of the deep mind. I noticed that the sigils of that the sigils of the Lamegaton's Goetia spirits were very similar to the Veves of Caribbean voodoo. I had done extensive research on voodoo for one of my adventure novels published in 1967. I knew the voodoo trance, wherein the participant becomes possessed by the spirit, was known to be hypnotic. The focal point of these ceremonies was the veve of the Ogun, drawn on the ground and illuminated by candles. Somehow this symbolic signature helped to bring forth the vision. At this point, your high school science teacher might be saying, well, if all this magic is only in the mind, weren't those old wizards and even the modern magicians like that Crowley fellow just using their imagination? <laughs> yes, they certainly were. But the human imagination, inspired by its divine creator, is the most powerful force in the universe, a river of hopes and dreams that bears us all along on its flowing course from the beginning to the end of time from planet Earth out to the farthest star. Let us recall a few lines from the greatest of the romantic poets, William Wordsworth. Of shouting angels and the imperial thrones I pass them unalarmed. Not chaos, not the darkest pit of lowest Erebus, or aught of blinder vacancy scooped out by help of dreams, can breed such fear and awe as fall upon us when we look into our minds, into the mind of man. With that in mind, let's look at the philosophy and the psychology that lies behind this powerful system. To begin with, we should not make the mistake of thinking that those old magicians were credulous and naive enough to believe that they could physically manifest the kind of heavenly glories and hellish horrors that Bosch and Blake depicted. These artists, like the Hollywood movie makers of today, symbolized the subtle power of magic with intense and sometimes lurid physical images. In magical operations, the roof does not fly off as choirs of angels descend in blinding rays of light, nor does the floor crack open to disgorge a horde of fire-breathing demons. The actual effects of magic are very powerful, but they are also subtle and subjective. As Cornelius Agrippa, one of the greatest of the Renaissance magicians, explained, there is another meaning than what is writ in the bare letters about this magical art. We must not look for the principle of these grand operations outside of ourselves. It is that internal spirit within us which can very well perform whatsoever the monstrous mathematicians, the prodigious magicians, the wonderful alchemists, and the bewitching necromancers can effect. Heinrich Cornelius Agrippa was certainly an honored philosopher and magus, but we should remember that King Solomon was considered to have been the wisest man who ever lived. The wisdom of Solomon was proverbial. Therefore, we should not be surprised to discover that Solomon's art of magic was actually an ancient system of psychology. But before we assume that the spirits of our brass vessel are merely a collection of private individual fantasies and yearnings, we must remember that the ancient philosopher known as Hermes Trismegistus, called Thrice Greatest Hermes, declared in his famous emerald tablet, True it is, without falsehood, certain and most true, that that which is above is like to that which is below and that which is below is like to that which is above to accomplish the miracles of one thing. 
Based upon this profound revelation, the Magi of classical times, the later medieval sorcerers, and the Renaissance magicians believed that the human mind was a miniature functioning model of the vast universe itself. The greater universe could be manipulated by magical operations within the personal sphere. Hermes Trismegistus had even gone so far as to suggest that in days of old men had created their own lesser gods. An ancient, outmoded, superstitious belief, your high school science teacher might say. Well, ancient, yes, but hardly obsolete. After 2,000 years, this strange statement by the original founder of Hermetic philosophy was finally explained in modern terms by the eminent psychologist Carl Gustav Jung. In the 1920s, Jung presented his revolutionary theory that beneath and beyond the personal subconscious mind, there flowed a vast, deep sea of dream images and forgotten lore. He referred to this as the collective unconscious. This mysterious psychic ocean was not the exclusive property of any individual human being. It was a dimension shared by all of us. Here one might discover the great archetypes of mythology, the heroes, the beautiful courtesans, the martyred saints, and the monstrous villains of our past. Here were the mysterious man-created gods which Hermes Trismegistus had written about so long ago. And here were the demons of King Solomon's brass vessel. Jung's famous colleague, Sigmund Freud, was quick to realize the significance of what Jung had discovered, or rediscovered, and Freud was horrified by it. Carl, he whispered, you must not present this theory to the public, for if you do, you will release a black flood of occultism. But it would take more than Carl Jung's archetype and collective unconscious theories to release this flood of occultism that Freud feared. Theories by themselves do not produce results. For results, the magician still depends today, as he did thousands of years ago, on methods and techniques. Since time immemorial, magicians have placed themselves and others into states of trance.